Hello and welcome back for another lecture on fluvial geomorphology. So this presentation in particular will teach us a little bit about uh, really rivers, uh, how they operate, how they change, uh, looking at the progression uh, or the maturity of their development, uh, and working through a little bit with flooding, uh, discharge, uh, and we'll wrap up things with some more, uh, cur well, not necessarily current events, but uh, events in our history, local history in Los Angeles, uh, and why it is important for us to actually study uh, river systems and their environments. So um, let's begin with that. Now it is important for us to understand rivers for a lot of reason. One is because we need water, right? Uh, without water, we can't have agriculture, we can't have people, we can't have water parks. Um, but the other piece is that water, although is incredibly important, can also be incredibly dangerous. So when dealing with floodwaters, flash floods, um, you know, extreme precipitation, we need to know and understand how do we regulate that water, that surface flow, where it goes, how it can be stored, and also how can we remove it from the landscape so it doesn't cause uh, any form of threatening uh, you know, situation or environment. So let's start off with that. So what is fluvial geomorphology? So uh, fluvial geomorphology is the science devoted to understanding rivers in their natural settings as well as to know how they respond with human-induced changes within a watershed or a region. So I found this uh, historic image of the Los Angeles River uh, when it was an actual free-flowing uh, river itself. So fluvial geomorphology is really dedicated to understanding how water, in particular riverways, uh, can change the earth. And then all around it, we study it. You know, Again, geomorphology means earth, change, and to study. So we are learning how to study how the earth is changing through the process of rivers and water. So uh, to, before we really dive into it, I wanted to present a slide with just some main key terms, some terms that we'll be able to work through. This is not all of them, but it's a good start. So the first one that I'll introduce is the head. The head of a river is the actual source, like you know, your thoughts. And then the mouth is where the river ends. So that would be your thought and where the thought is executed. Uh, you know, we find the head, the headwaters themselves being high up in mountains, usually uh, by a source of water, maybe a lake, uh, maybe a storm system, things like that. Uh, the mouth is where the river ends, usually in a large body of water. It can be uh, along a, a lake line, a shoreline, or in some case we have what we consider disappearing streams where they either just completely evaporate because the river never makes it to its final destination, um, or it can just um, end in some form of terminal location. Uh, runoff. Uh, runoff is a phrase that we use for water that literally just runs off the surface. So we don't really have a way to uh, to store it or to use it. It just literally is deters the water and runs it off. So think about runoff like um, when it rains, the water runs down the street. It's running off your driveway into the street and then it goes into uh, the storm channel or watershed and, and gets lost. A tributary is a name for a small channel of water that contributes. So when I think of tributary, I think of contributing. So a small creek or a small channel that will merge into your main river, that is a tributary because it is contributing to the dominant channel. So here in Santa Clarita, our main river is the Santa Clara River that runs pretty much... Uh, more or less uh, northeast to southwest, kind of running through the entire valley. And all the little creeks and streams and uh, the storm drains all dump into the Santa Clara River. So they are all contributing, or they were all tributaries to that main channel. Alluvium. Alluvium is really the material that has been deposited by running water. Uh, discharge. We measure discharge in river systems. Uh, the formula is Q is equal to A times V. Uh, essentially, discharge is understanding the amount of water that is passing through a river channel. So uh, an example of discharge to you would be like your faucet in your bathtub. So you have an area, the, the plumbing, and then you have a velocity or the speed in which the water can travel through that plumbing. And we can then measure that and understand you know, how long will it take to fill your bathtub. 
but in this case, we look at rivers. Uh, the drainage basin, uh, that is the entire region in which water uh, will uh, be transferred. And so as an example, uh, looking at Los Angeles County, we have several basins in which the water will, will pull from and drain it towards the central part, and then it you know, heads out uh, through the main channel. So think about, uh, again, the Santa Clara River. If we were to map that out as a string, you know, as a, as a line showing where it ends over in... Um, you know, the Ventura County area over in the ocean, and then where it starts higher up beyond Acton, Palmdale, Lancaster. And we were to map that all out and draw every little tributary that adds to it, we would have a very pretty design, kind of like a, looks like a, like a tree root in a, in, a, in a sense, where you have the main channel and then all the little branching arms, the tributaries that bring in. Uh, that would be part of a drainage basin. Uh, but we'll talk more about that in a different video. Uh, then we have perennial, and we have intermittent, and ephemeral streams. So those are names that we give to streams that run differently. So perennial is like annual, uh, it runs all year round. Uh, intermittent means that water flows at least one month out of the year, and ephemeral means it's pretty much dry all the time, very rarely will fill with water. So those are some key terms to understand different you know uh, values of rivers, and we'll be referencing some of that as we move forward. So uh, moving forward within this, uh, something that we haven't mentioned yet will be stream progression. There's lots of different studies on stream progression and how it's observed. Um, where I come, where my learnings have come from, uh, we have been able to identify at river systems as a, as a sense of progression uh, within that region. So it is very um, common for one particular re river system to have all three different types of these progression. So uh, I'll start with the diagram here on the left. So here we have what we identify as young, then we have mature, and then old. So much like with people, we really don't have a number that really associates with maturity, right? So because you probably have met a very, very mature 18-year-old, and you probably have met a very immature 60-year-old. So we don't really associate um, ages. We understand that time is involved, but these terms really are used to describe not just the progression, but really the relief and the topography and the features that are observed on those surfaces. So as an example, uh, during a young stream system, this top image here, we can see that the gradient is very, very steep. Therefore, as the water flushes down, it moves very quickly. It's in a very narrow V-shaped channel uh, where incision occurs. Think about it, the deeper you, you, know, you dig down, at some point, the cliffs can no longer support their, their weight and they collapse. So then, you know, not only does it continue to dig down deeper, but it can slowly get wider, deeper, and wider. At some point, you lose a majority of that material. It also loses a majority of that gradient or slope. So we develop a mature system. So now we can see the river is, you know, that is somewhat V-shaped in its channel. Um, but the reality is the river now starts to wiggle across a very poorly but present floodplain. Then at some point, it gets super, super flat because, again, you keep digging down. It gets wider, down, and wider. Now you have very, very, very rich and broad uh, floodplain. You have very broad meandering where the river goes from bank to bank on either side of that floodplain. So these really rich curves, very gentle slope. And in this fact, we can see the river where the mouth is, it's dumping into a large body of water. You see these little islands that have deposited? Uh, this area would be identified as a delta. And because the water, when it hits the delta, loses its energy, right? The river was moving down the slope. Then when it hits a large body of standing water, it loses its energy. So it actually drops all the material that would have been moved. Uh, it drops it here, and this is what we would call a delta. Uh, and in fact, when the river splits up throughout that delta, we call those distributaries because that main channel is now being distributed uh, into you know, smaller regions. So it's kind of interesting. So this diagram here, bottom right, uh, again, young, mature, and old, um, an old age in its system. I like this because it provided a list of characteristics and also uh, identifiable features that are observed. So again, looking at something that would be young, uh, it would be steep, V-shaped valley, very narrow, shallow uh, channels, uh, high bed load, meaning that lots of material is moving because of active incision. We can see there's waterfalls, there's going to be um, 
rapids, gorges, things like that. Moving into a middle course stream, uh, again, open, gently sloping valley with floodplain, wider, deeper channels. Uh, we start to see the beginnings of meanders. Uh, we start seeing uh, river cliffs, uh, which are pretty much river cliffs are like uh, uh, terraces that develop on the side. And then we get into an old age one, very, very gently sloping valley, very wide and flat. Uh, think of like Mississippi, uh, the Mississippi River there, um, Oxbow Lakes, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, floodplains, and then levees. Now, what's interesting about this development is that obviously this is going to be young, mature, old, great. Now, at some point, the mature will become old, and the young will become mature, and at some point, everything disappears, right? So think of it as a system like that. So you have young, mature, and old age. You know, maybe a, a river that's on a large mountain, and over millions and millions and millions of years, at some point, that river, that uh, mountain, rather, will disappear. Well, that's because this system has moved all that material and erased it from the landscape. So that is a possibility. The other possibility uh, during this process is that uh, we have this phrase called rejuvenation, and maybe you're familiar with it. It's kind of like Botox on the landscape. You know, you, you know people get plastic surgery and, and refreshes themselves. Well, rejuvenation can occur, uh, usually because of tectonics, a large earthquake, which means maybe your uh, river, your uh, region that you're studying is a middle course or mature stream, then you have a really large earthquake and causes uplift to occur. Well, you've now rejuvenated this and brought it back up into a young stream system. So we see this uh, in places such as the Grand Canyon. Uh, the Grand Canyon is an excellent example of rejuvenation in which because of the Colorado Plateau continuing to uplift, and the river continues to cut down, it almost never shows any additional progression in its maturity because it continues to cut down and get wider, down, and wider. And that is why, uh, if you've ever had the opportunity of going, that the Grand Canyon in some places can be as wide as 18 miles across and nearly 2 miles in depth because it continues to be rejuvenated. At some point it will not, and when that ceases to exist, that rejuvenation, then the river itself will begin to transition again through middle and lower course systems. So, kind of fun facts. So, I mentioned some of these features that are seen here. Well, what do they look like? Well, some of the features can look like this. So, why do rivers curve? So, I have these three little uh, images we'll look through real quick. So, the first one says, erosion happens where the flow hits the side of the river flowing downstream. So, in these, this particular image here, the water is flowing to the bottom of your screen. As we can see, this is your river and here's your landscape. So, if I hit play, we'll talk through it. These little white dots represent the energy or those water molecules. Notice how when a slight curve occurs, the energy hits on one side and gets thrown to the opposite side that it bounces back and forth. So what could cause this to begin with? Any bit of disturbance, a rock, uh, uh, you know, a, a tree falling over some kind of vegetation, uh, maybe a little mudslide, something like that. It doesn't take a whole lot to redirect the whole piece. Now, what's interesting about this, and I'll talk about real quick, is that uh, this white arrow is really showing that energy stream, you know, where it's going. Think about when you're in your car and you're driving in a straight line and you make a sharp left-hand turn. Well, where does everything go in the back of your car? If you make that left-hand turn, those things kind of, you know, they maintain in their motion, but they get kind of thrown to the right. Well, that's what happens here. As the river is turning towards, you know, this direction, so following would be turning uh to the left, look at how far the this white uh, line, the arrow, gets thrown to the right-hand side. So it gets thrown on opposite sides. Well, why is that important? Well, because over time, you'll create really big meanders like this. Now, sometimes meandering rivers close on themselves. Well, these meanders become so big that at some point they bump into one another, and then water will choose the path of least resistance, the shortest path, and essentially redraw its boundary. So we'll watch that again. But, you know, these meanders continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then at some point, if they bump into one another, you have an abandoned channel. That's what we call an oxbow or oxbow lake. So I'll stop that. So this is a neat little cartoon. Uh, this is an animation showing uh, several uh, decades of a particular river system and watching it change. And why is this not playing? Okay. Well. Anyway, I'm going to move on. 
So what ends up happening is this is the current river system. It's flowing. Uh, at some point, as you can see these little shadowy lines here, this river continues to get broader and wider and wider. Something else I can point out in this image is that uh, understanding that the river is flowing you know, to the bottom lower right of your screen. This area here is an area of erosion because that water's you know making a sharp left-hand turn and that energy is getting thrown to the right. It's going to continue to erode. This material is taken from here, transported and deposited down here. That's why we have this area of erosion and deposition always across from one another. But we'll get to talk more about that in this diagram. So landscape development. So same thing. Uh, if I hit the little play button, you can see the water is going from the top right to the bottom left. You notice that this black line uh, represents the flow and direction of water. So watch my uh, little um, cursor here. So if my cursor were to represent the fastest part of that stream, oh, the, the river is making a sharp left, so I'm going to get thrown all the way on the outside. I'm going to erode this material, take it down here, and deposit here. This is the area of low velocity, area of high velocity. So if you're a fish and you wanted to you know, flush through this river system, you would stay where the black arrows are flowing because that's moving the fastest. If you want to just kind of sit around and relax, you would stay in these point bar areas. Now you see these dotted lines? These dotted lines show areas of deposition. So as this river continues to widen its meander, the material cut from the cut bank is brought down oops, brought down to there. Uh, let's see here, these are some very deep pools that occur on the outside of turns. Uh, again, area of erosion, so it's deeper here, area of deposition, area of erosion and deposition. Here we can see that uh, here we have an oxbow lake developing. Uh, because at some point this was so large that it ended up bumping into one another like we saw in the previous video. Here we have some what they're calling the bluff line. So this, this area in between here would represent your floodplain. Oh, it's labeled right there. Well, let's look more at understanding how we measure the amount of water that's being transferred. So the first thing we can look at is we'll look at the material that's being moved. So we have what we study as uh, sediment transport. So there's three ways in which material can be moved in a river. We study its bed load, its dissolved load, and its suspended load. So the reason that those three types of material exist is because they're different grain sizes. So think of these three options as being, um, you guys have all had the... Um, those little packets, you tear the packet off and you put the powder in your bottle of water and you shake it up, whether it be a protein drink or an energy drink or something like that. So you notice that then three things occur. You either have really big class that sink to the bottom, that would be your bed load. Some of that stuff will be completely dissolved or mixed within the water. So you couldn't like try to pick it out because it's been completely dissolved. And then sometimes you might have floaties, the floaty stuff that sinks on the top, you know, that floats to the top of the water bottle. Uh, that would be your suspended load. So think about it like that. So in this diagram here, they're showing that your bed load will be sand and gravel size, your suspended load will be the silts and clays, and then everything else that's been completely dissolved becomes part of the dissolved load. So this is a photo that I took on my cell phone. This is. Um, right outside of Zion National Park. So we're looking at the river flowing, uh, in this particular case, um, you know, following the direction in which the water is flowing, which is away from us, we can see that this water is not perfectly clear, meaning that there must be some dissolved load within the water. We can also see that it's a little murky in the top, so there must be some um, suspended load. And then you can see these big rocks that are within the river itself. Well, that'd be part of your bed load. It doesn't move as much. What's interesting, though, is that the rocks, when they do slowly move over time, we find that they'll become very rounded. So what's interesting about that idea is that when we start learning about other environments, we find that how the rocks are eroded or the material is eroded can be very different per environment. So we find that usually in river systems things are rounded or they're rollers. We're looking like a rolling pin because they've rolled down a river. We find that in a you know a beach environment, a coastal environment, because the waves splashing up and down on the beach face will make the rocks rounded but more disc shaped. So 
something to kind of think about in the back of your mind. So this is how we look at the material that's being moved. Well, what about the water? Well, that's a little more complicated. So what we do is what we call stream discharge. So we want to understand how much water is being moved in a river. Well, why is that important? Well, it's important because the more we understand, the more we can then store water for our consumption, or the more we can allow water to transfer to go to a different location, can go to turn into runoff and be in a safe environment. Here's a photo I took of, uh, of uh, Lake Sabrina in Bishop, California. This is drainage that is being regulated and measured out of a large reservoir. So the way that this is done is we need to first understand the cross-sectional area. So unfortunately, rivers are not all the same. They're not all squares. So we can't just do a normal, you know, understand its area of width times depth because that's assuming it's a square. So what we would do is we would actually subdivide this river system into smaller pieces and calculate the area and shape of each one of these subsections and then add it together to understand a cumulative understanding of the full area. So the first thing is we need to know the area. The area is width times depth. So we would take the width times depth of here, of here, of here, of here, of here, and then we would add it all up to understand a full geometric design of what that river looks like. Well, why are the bottoms of rivers never the same? Great question. Because water moves and moves material, it depends on where you are in the stream, can actually deepen the river itself. So again, remember, if the river is flowing towards you, I'm the source, you're the mouth. And if it's going in a straight line, we find that the rivers usually create that nice, like a V shape, because the energy is focused in the middle. But like I mentioned, what if the river makes a sharp left-hand turn? Well, that energy gets thrown to the right. So the right-hand side will actually become deeper and make a pool. So in this case, we can see it's deeper on this side, so this river must be slowly making a turn. Well, the next part is discharge. Uh, we look at the, the area multiplied by its velocity. There's lots of different ways to measure velocity. Um, there's really fancy tools to do it, and then there's some not so fancy, and we'll talk about those in a moment. But the idea of discharge is how do we understand how much water is being passed through a river at a particular time on both the spectrum of max and minimum load, right? So maybe you have a little uh, creek or stream behind your house that does not have water in it very often, but when it does, it gets filled. Well, we already have measured and understood the maximum capacity. Why is it important? Well, living in Santa Clarita, we have several lakes that are around us that have dams. We want to know the maximum capacity so that we know how fast the dams and lakes will fill. That way we can then release additional water to compensate gains versus losses, but also to prevent them from overflowing and breaking. So you see there's a little float here. It's a fancy word for an orange. We'll talk about that on the next slide. So we look at uh, stream velocity. Um, what we do is the first thing I want to mention is the Talweg. The Talweg is the line of the lowest elevation. So this little cross here represents the Talweg. We often find that the Talweg is also in line with the fastest part of the stream. So this little diagram here is representing velocities in meters per second. So we can see that this is moving at 0 0.05 meters, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and the fastest part of the stream is this little pocket, this little uh, carpool lane, as it were, in the middle here. Well, why does this occur? Why is it we get closer towards the bottom along these rims that they become slower? Well, friction. This is the earth, and this water is becoming um, caught up with the perimeter of that river. It is moving that material. It's plucking and pulling it, but it creates friction and it slows it down. Now, how do we measure this? Well, the, we can use a, a traditional velocity uh, meter, which is about $1,200, or we use orange peels. We literally just take the orange peel. What we'll do is we'll have bunches of them, and we'll measure a certain um, length in the river and a width, and we'll drop them along the width and measure how long it takes to go that distance of length. And we'll do this multiple times to get an average because if we drop the orange peel over here not realizing that this is the fastest velocity, we're not getting a good understanding of the general speed in which the river is flowing. So we'll drop orange pieces all along the river and do so. So here's a photo of some people. Uh, this is Jason. There's Chris. And they're using this large um, 
it's a survey rod, but it has a measurement on it. They're measuring the depth of this small creek. And then later we used, um, this was at Cal State Northridge, so they can afford to have a velocity meter. We use a little velocity meter. Well, it's a stick with a propeller on the end, and the propeller spins, and we can just do, 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 do along the, the river width there to get its distances. So again, because of understanding its velocity and its area, we can under oops sorry we can uh, calculate its discharge. So the formula for discharge is where discharge is equal to Q. Remember this up here, and Q or discharge is equal to the overall area times its velocity. Okay, moving forward. Hydrographs and discharge. Why is this important? Well, now we can put that discharge onto a hydrograph. That's what this is representing. So what this shows us is um, they're showing, in particular, a two-day storm, a very large storm, and this is really that bucket of water uh, and how it transfers. We find that this can change in different environments. So um, I, the way that I envision this is imagine that your storm is a five-gallon bucket of water, and you just dump it. You know, like that, you swoosh, right there across the ground. And if you could play it in slow motion, you would see that there's a little at the beginning, then there's a big curve, and then it bellows back out, right? Because that big curve is the bulk of that water coming towards, you know, the direction in which you threw it. Well, that's what I see here. Now, that can be different on two different types of surfaces. If you're doing that on, you know, dirt, and it's nice and calm, whatever, no plants, no big rocks restricting things, it's just nice dirt, the dirt will absorb it. Right, and so that you know the large curve starts to become absorbed, and it actually gets spread farther out. So it kind of does like a this type of thing. In this case, they're giving an example of how discharge would look in a large rainstorm in perhaps an area that has lots of concrete, maybe uh, in a city or a street. And you watch it all of a sudden because there's no friction, because the water can move quickly, nothing is being absorbed. It peaks really high, like a flash flood, and then comes back out. So that being said, the lag time here is the time in which the peak rainfall occurred to where the peak discharge is observed. Again, throwing that bucket and seeing that big curve in the water. That peak to peak is what that means. So why is this important? Well, because we can replicate this diagram in a system like this. Now, you're probably thinking it looks like a weird teardrop, but this replicates a drainage basin. So let's just assume that the central line here represents the Santa Clara River. And each one of these little tributaries is exactly what they are. So what they're saying is, well, if you are right here and you are only measuring the water from here to here, that is what your... Um, drainage would look like. The Q is discharge, the T is the time. Well, now we'll do one down here. Well, notice that it looks a little bit different. Well, why is that? Well, you have increased your discharge because now you have one, two, three tributaries bringing water into this point. So that's something to keep in mind. Then you go down here, look at how much it's increased here and the time. Well, why is this much bigger? Because now you have one, two, three, four, five tributaries bringing in water. So think about it like this. If you wanted to play in a uh, in the most little amount of water, you would play up in here. If you want to play in a deeper pool system, you'd play down here. So they're showing what these will all look like So over time. So this is kind of that idea. I usually explain this in class like as a road. So if you lived here, you only have one car for traffic. If you lived here, you would have three cars going up and down your street. And if you lived here, you'd have now five cars going up and down your street. So you have a lot more passing this point than you do places further up towards the source. So that's one way to look at it. Now this drainage basin is called a dendritic drainage basin because it looks like a dendrite or a root system. There are lots of different types of drainage basins. So as we can see, this is your classic dendritic. We can have a rectangular based on jointing. We have a trellis system where it's more uh, perpendicular to itself. Here's a radial, meaning that you have it radiates away from the center of a piece, so like a volcano. And this would represent a parallel uh, drainage basin. So what's interesting about the drainage basins is that water goes downhill, right? But what the design will reflect the overlying topography. 
So looking at places like a volcano versus places that show um, more of a faulting jointed zone, looking at perhaps um, like the foothills or sides of large mountains, you'll be able to see differences. But this dendritic is the most common out of all drainage basin styles. All right, so we've covered a lot. Uh, I just want to kind of end on the note of putting this into perspective. I've got just a couple more slides. So something that's interesting to talk about is the Los Angeles River. So you know it as the big concrete channel, but it didn't always look like that. Uh, you know, in fact, going back to our first slide, I introduced this as being the Los Angeles River. So look at this very rich riparian or uh, river vegetation. There's dirt. Uh, you know, what ends up happening in this situation is that when you have a normal river, you have, but there's people out there, um, you have all of this vegetation and all these rocks and all this debris that creates friction and moving the velocity or the, um, the strength and speed of a river. Well, in 1938, Los Angeles had an incredible rain. Two very large storms occurred. In fact, the largest of them, because of orographic lifting, meaning the clouds were forced up uh, in altitude along the San Gabriel Mountains, which means that therefore by lifting it up, it gets colder, condensing, and then it just really just rang out all the moisture in those clouds. Uh, it rained a tremendous amount in 1938. In doing so, uh, as a result of the overlying topography, which was pretty much due to clay soils, and very dry to begin with. Water was unabsorbed, so you had what we considered aggressive runoff or flash flooding. So some areas received 32 inches of rain in about 15 hours. Uh, damage was seen uh, all, in all of LA County, uh, also Orange County and Riverside. In fact, some places of Orange County and Riverside in 1938 had over six feet of standing water because it didn't, it wasn't able to drain anywhere. And ooh, 7,000. Over 7,000 structures and over $40 million of damage was done then, and by today's value, about $627 million. So here we have, um, this is the uh, Southern Pacific Railroad, that bridge got knocked out, the, free, the five freeways down here right now in today's standard. Uh, this is a great photo. If you've ever been over in Malibu, this gas station is still there. This is PCH. All of these homes and debris were all taken down the 110, <laughs> and always started in Pasadena. So the water drained from Pasadena all the way to Malibu, taking homes and everything with it. This was a three-story building. Uh, as you can see, it's now one and a half. It, it collapsed on itself. This was incredibly uh, devastating. Here's some additional photos of people at that time. Um, here we can see that you know, the bridge, actually that bridge is still there in downtown. Um, seeing all of this damage was and, and knowing that over 110 people had uh, passed, uh, they decided that the best thing to do is to then put a concrete channel in the LA River because what ended up happening is there was so much rain that the water was, in, was not able to move fast enough, so it overflowed. And it had done it a couple other times, but this was the worst. It's one of the worst rains that we've had. So what they did is they put a concrete channel in. Why? Well, by putting a concrete channel in, you regulate uh, velocity because there's no um, restriction or there's no um, pushback on the material and the water that is in motion. Um, and it was to prevent any additional floods of this kind. So it, again, the LA River received a lot of precipitation in the 70s, another one in the 90s, and also one in the early 2000s. Now, just a couple of years ago, they voted to remove the concrete channel because by having a concrete channel, you're not allowing for water to be absorbed into the earth. And that actually really restricts the water table and the areas in which water can be stored under the surface. So they decided to remove it, but most of those people at those committees did not bring up the fact that the reason why it was even there was because of this. Uh, to kind of put it in perspective of a video, I found this really neat video showing uh, the aftermath, the day after. These are people's uh, eight millimeter uh, handheld cameras that they filmed. So they're showing all the different houses. These are all areas in LA. Uh, some of these photos were taken from Sunland to Hunga. Some were taken in Malibu and downtown LA. That's the one of Malibu right there. So looking at all of this water that had to be displaced. So it was really uh, quite tragic. There's some great documentaries on it. I highly suggest it if this is something that interests you to see. But it's important because of this, 
we then learned through the help with the Army Corps of Engineers how to design um, the geometry of a concrete channel to prevent this type of flooding situation to occur. Uh, they, I, they identified that this is being a 50-year flood, which means if this happened in 38, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, so it happened, there's one that happened in the late 70s, would have been 80, 90, 2000, 10, 20. So we're actually looking at another large rain system of this magnitude within the next 10 years. All right, we covered a lot. To kind of recap, we introduced, uh, again, uh, the geometry, the discharge, a couple of the landscape and landforms. We also introduced why rivers curve. There's lots of additional resources on Canvas. Make sure you utilize that. But I hope that this was at least somewhat helpful in understanding really why it is important that we study river systems as a whole, not just for our use, but for our safety. That being said, thank you very much, and we'll talk soon.